Hi, everybody. I'm Amy. And I'm Audrea. And this is the right crowd. So grab a cup of coffee. Oh, Snoopy. Or a cup of tea. <laughs> or maybe a little something on the rocks. And let's get started. Yay. Okay, so last week we introduced our new book, The Anatomy of Story. I said it right this time. <laughs> Today, we are going to dive into the next two chapters, chapter four and chapter five. So chapter four is all about character and all the things that go with it. Indeed. And he spends a lot of time on character and basic parts of character, which is nice. And I love that we're doing this together as a book club. Um, and I hope you guys are reading and, and participating along at home because this book, I know we said it during the intro, this book um, is a tome. I mean, it is thick and it's, it's like reading a, a, a college textbook, almost. I mean, he breaks things down and he has some great exercises, but this is one that it's great to talk about with um, a, a friend or an author friend. So now, yeah, we're talking about character. Let me get to the right post-it. Ready. And, and for me, um, I found myself reading some sections more than once because his take on it is very different from other takes. Yes. And I was like, oh, I like this. Okay, now wait, tell me again what you just said. So um, I found myself um, going back. And one of the things that he points out in the very beginning of character is he says, most characters come, most writers come at character all wrong. And then he goes through and explains to you the different process that he thinks is more useful. Um, it gives you all of the steps. The other thing I like what he does with his is, um, as the other books have done that we've gone over, is he gives you the steps and then he gives you the examples. So it's not just, here's my take on it and you're going to take it as gospel. It's here's my take on it. And here's where you can see it in a book that has already been published. Yes. Or a, a movie. Um, or a, a movie. Of, yes. Yeah. So, um, and there are movies that he uses a lot throughout the books. Um, he does use Harry Potter uh, books or uh, he uses those. He also uses um, the Godfather. That's a favorite. He goes back to that one several times, but it's also a classic um, for um, showing character and, and, and things like that. One of my favorites uh, for this chapter was um, one of the very first lines, which I still have to remind myself of, even though I'm writing not literary fiction, but I'm writing genre fiction or series fiction. I'm writing cozy mysteries right now and uh, other books in, in the future. But um, he says, uh, we'll begin not by focusing on your main character, but by looking at all of your characters together as part of an interconnected web. And I love that concept. And yeah. I, I think that'll help, that helps. Um, and that helped me when I read it. This is the like the second time that I've gone through uh, this book. And I took one, I uh, was lucky enough to take a short class with him. I'd love to take a, a bigger class with him, but um, was that it helps to, it helps uh, with developing characters that are that are beyond that are three dimensional that have all the facets they're three hundred you know that are real on the page and not just cardboard cutouts and that's um, a lot of people spend all their time on the main character or the main character and now we we know to spend a lot of time on the opposition which is what he calls your antagonist um, so your hero and your antagonist and forget about those other supporting characters your the uh, the rest of the cast of your book and he talks about and gives great examples of how to develop the cast. Did y'all just hear that? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> my dog shook her head right on my chair. And oh. so it made this really loud sound on my side. And I'm like, uh-oh. Oh. oh. Um, one thing I, I think is good that he points out at the very beginning of his character web section is he says the biggest mistake writers make when creating characters is that they think of the hero and all other characters as separate individuals. Yeah. And he shows you how to help them all work together and basically play off each other um, 
so that your story is more engaging and your reader wants to continue going on. And it's more like real life. Yes. It's not, it's not, here's your main character. Here's your hero over here. It's like watching, it's like watching an action movie where a gang of people come up to fight the hero and they come up one at a time. Oh, like that doesn't, no, that doesn't happen in John Wick. Just so we're clear, John Wick, <laughs> they all fight him at the same time and he kicks all their tails all at the same time. But there's a lot of movies where the hero comes up and he's ready to fight. And then one guy will come up and he'll yeah. fight him. Okay, your turn. Like that is, that's not real life. In real life, they all come at you at the same time and it's an <laughs> interweb of people. Yeah. And he points that out in here and shows you how to make that the way your writing is so that it's more engaging and gets your reader wanting to know more and move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I love that part because we're in reality. We, I just love that. Color. <laughs> Sorry. And it's yellow. I love yellow. Uh, one of my second favorite colors next to orange, <laughs> but um, I'll show you the other side. Let me turn it around. Okay. Ta-da! Oh, fun. See, that's, that's a, that's a hat make you smile kind of mug. That's this a- is Randy's mug. Ah. I borrow it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in real life, um, we're all, I mean, no man is an island, famous, you know, expression. And I think he references that. In this he book. actually does. He references yeah. it in here. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no man or woman is an island. Um, we're all in relationship to someone else, whether that's a close relationship or a, a relationship that needs work, but it's a relationship. We're all interrelated and your characters should be um, that too or related well as well. And I, one of the things he says is, um, got all kinds of highlights and different color tabs and things like that, is each time you compare a character to your hero, you force yourself to distinguish the hero in new ways. So it helps you to develop that multifaceted, deep, multidimensional hero as well. Um, he also gives a good definition of what a hero is, and what an opponent is mm-hmm. um, and I like that he he points that out and then he and he also goes through is that there's not just one opponent opponent a lot of times oh yeah there's the main one there's the second one and then he goes through there's like fake ally opponent um and he like actually tells you who they are like he uses um Hamlet as the example and goes through and tells you who all the opponents are um, and explains to you what the different um, opponents and um, allies are, like the definition of what they truly are in a book or a screenplay. And I love how he, yeah, that whole, and I'm not sure if this is the first place I saw it because it's been years since I first did this one, but um, that whole, you can have um, a fake ally opponent or a fake opponent ally. And um, some examples of that in uh, those different um, pieces or um, of fiction he gives you. And for those of you who are wondering, um, one other example, good example of that that I love, it's a classic spoiler alert for um, Harry Potter, Harry Potter, if you've not read it, but um, Snape. Snape is your classic fake opponent ally. Um, so if it, it, that's how it turns out. Um, I don't remember which book it is. You, you find out the truth about Snape and the relationship he has with Harry Potter. But um, he talks about in here, um, when you're building the relationship, he gives this really great, so which page is it on? This really great illustration of, I've got so much stuff highlighted in so many tabs, uh, of the character web and how to uh, illustrate the relationship and the oh do you have it handy that thing where he draws the box I should have oh that's um that's I think that's further down oh oh there it is okay I'm skipping ahead but I'm going to show it to you since I started flipping to it um (laughs) there you go this is uh, an example of the relationship or the dynamic between all of the opponents and the heroes and I just love that and I went through that exercise with my current whip work in progress um several times so that's a super um handy um thing to um to to pull out of this book and use frequently on your on your revisions and your um works in progress so i'm wondering which one of our books 
was written first because my chart's at the top of my page. OMG, that's interesting. And what page was yours on? Mine's on page 95. Mine is on page 97. You have more stuff again. How did that happen? <laughs> That's hilarious. How does that happen? Because it looks the same. It's the same. Interesting. You must have an updated and expanded version. Or maybe he took some stuff out. Okay, now I'm curious as to like, uh, when was yours Use at the moment, everyone, as we figure yeah. this out. Let's look at the copyright. You guys play along at home. What's the copyright for your book? My copyright is 2007. Okay, my copyright is 2007. And then the versions down below are that it goes from 30 over here, 30 to 24. And I can't remember what that tells you, but it tells you something. What is yours? Mine is 30 to 26. See, yours is more updated, I believe. That means something happened i wonder if he you know we're gonna meet him or we can ask him <laughs> yeah let's do that all right so <laughs> why is hers different did you take something out or put something in we need to know okay so all right back to character um all right, so I skipped a little bit ahead to go to that um, that conflict map. Um, character web, huge, really important exercise. Are you still laughing about the differences? We're so easily squirreled. <laughs> um, oh, and then one of the other things I highlighted or underlined in here and put like an exclamation like, yes thing is that every every character must <laughs> I'm sorry it's like on page it doesn't make I can't say I it doesn't make you what page I'm like it doesn't matter actually maybe it does what page are you on I'm on page 58 at the top of that page it's character web by function in the story yeah it doesn't work I can't go to 56 because 56 is that page oh interesting <laughs> again squirrel okay. sorry everybody um all right I'm just so, gonna listen. all right so mine it says every character must serve not a purpose which is what i've been working on in my revisions because i'm in the middle of revisions right now every character in your book must serve a purpose but he says every character must serve the purpose the purpose of the story and that's where it's like oh my god yes there is a purpose for the story. So they not, not only have to have their own thing, they can't just be some per person standing there just to go, it was a red shoe. <laughs> and that's the only thing they do in the story. But they have to have their own purpose, but they must serve the purpose for your book or story. And I found it. It's on the top of page 58. That's what I said, 58. I know, which means somewhere between this page and the page with the square is where there's a change in the book. <laughs> okay, get out your font rulers, everybody, and let's measure. Maybe it's a font size. <laughs> let's play oh detective. But yes, I underlined that part as well. That's so funny yeah. that we underlined the same thing. Okay. Um, and remember, we do this like a book club. So we're talking about I mean, going through this book and um, how it applies to our own stuff. Um, we always recommend if we're doing a book, it's usually it's because we like it. We're not going to do books we don't like. Um, we're, we're nice because nice matters. Um, but um, well, also because we have to read it. Yeah, that's true. And then we have to do this video. Yeah. And do I really want to go sit here and go, well, I guess we could talk about well, on 95, page 95, there was an interesting something. Like, no. no. Yeah. That's um, not helping anybody. No. No. Um, okay. And so then it, it goes into that whole hero, opponent, ally, fake ally, fake opponent, ally thing, which is so cool to read his definitions of that. And also what really got me um, excited was his um, definition of a subplot character and um, how that's not usually, is not usually the ally, but is a mirror character in your book, which I've seen books do that. And I actually found myself doing that. I don't know if it was an accident or maybe it was from the class that I had a character that was, um, but I couldn't carry that throughout. I didn't have a, a throughput of that. It was, 
uh, at certain points or junctures in the story, there's a different mirror. But that whole concept of a subplot character as mirroring the journey or the conflict for your hero is fascinating. Yes, and um, I had a question mark next to it because I think it was a little bit of a, wait, what? I know, me. yes. Is um, yeah, it's um, because it's not something that I've ever heard before, like put in that way. Yeah. Put in that way. Um, and they say that the, and he, he gives Hamlet is a lot of what he gives yeah. an example for. Um, and um, apparently there is a subplot character in Hamlet, but there's not one in Silence of the Lambs. Because he gives that character, he gives the chart of, after he goes through all the things, here's Silence of the Lambs, here's who all the people are that fill it, and there's a nun next to subplot character. I do like that um, Clarice's fake opponent ally is Hannibal spoilers yes and it really is like it really is like he does so much for her he really does yeah yeah so yeah so that was that was good and that i mean if you guys have not i mean that it's a book for it was for a book of it was a book first but if you haven't seen the movie the movie is fabulous i mean absolutely re 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 watchable but not uh, for your children no, no this is for after your children go to bed yeah. Um, but um, when you see that relationship play out um, and how even a, he's helping her, I mean, you would think, I mean, this is this convicted, horrid, you know, person. And she, um, he's, he's, um, Truby says that in his book that you will find throughout that, the book or the movie that the character of Hannibal teaches her more than her, um, uh, her time at the academy. And that's yeah. sometimes can be true in life. You learn so much from, you know, your things that make you stronger. You know, yeah. <laughs> why it's an expression, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And sometimes it's the um, opponents or fake opponents in your, your work in progress for the hero. Yeah. Okay, the next part he talks about is character technique. Um, two main characters. Um, and he says that like for a love story, you have to have two equally well-defined characters makes certain requirements for the character web of your story. So if you're going to have two main people, you have to have them both aligned and both developed yes. properly, or one's going to run away with your story. Um, and he says that you have to detail the needs of both characters However, your main character, your main, main person is um, the main desire line that's going to be followed. So they both have a purpose, but you're only going to follow the main line of one yeah. character. And I have to tell you, I've read books where they have tried to have two main characters and two main storylines. And I will relate to one. And then every time that other person's viewpoint comes up, I'm like, I hope I'm not <laughs> missing anything important to the story because I could care less about this character. I want to get back to this one. Yeah, yeah. Right? So you don't want to divide your reader's attention. If you do, you could lose a reader. Yeah. Because they're going to be like, well, if this is the way they write, like I only read half the book. Yeah. Because I didn't, like, you have to be, you have to interweave it together, but only let, like, one needs to edge out the other one just yeah. a little bit and i love the what he calls it he he says and um I've, I've seen a lot of lectures with him it's the desire line there's can be only one there can be multiple characters but there can be only one main desire line of your book and that desire line carries the book from you know or the movie from start to finish and it has to be something that um and we're getting a, a little bit ahead but it has to be something that your reader is um it has to be clear so we know we know what's at stake and what the desire line is, and we know when the hero has attained whatever it is. So it has to be something, even if it's something ephemeral, but it has to be something that we know when they've they've gotten it. 
Um, but that's a really cool concept. And that comes up a lot in, I mean, speaking of character where you have multiple characters or two characters, they do that a lot in romance books, especially these days. Um, so yeah. it used to be um, it, back in the day when I was reading Dime Store Harlequins because I, I was buying them at the thrift shop with my grandma. Um, they, it was written, it was the, it was the heroines. It was the girls line. These days, these rom-coms and rom romances, you they give you, um, they're written from the guy's point or the girl's point of view and the girl's point of view and the guy's point of view, or if they're male, male, the male and the male. But um, so you're, you're seeing each of their side of the story, but um, there's still one, if it's written well, there's one desire line. So we know when we've, we're satisfied at the end because we've gotten right. that main thing. And then he gives some great techniques for building characters, like uh, b building a character web by archetype. And um, there are many books on archetypes. Um, so archetypes, archetypes um, examples of those are like your king or your father, your goddess or mother. Um, he doesn't mention, or queen, he says queen or mother, your wise old man wise old woman mentor um so um I, I can't remember the the craft book I read where they said you have to have these archetypes in your story all stories have to have these especially when you, and you'll see them a lot these archetypes in fantasy books there's always a mentor or a teacher and there's always you know um the the mother or father figure and then there's always the fool and um for those of you who are familiar with tarot these are some of the the archetypes that are in um your common um weight tarot decks the the goddess the queen the mother and and so forth and so he gives that a great example of how to build um a characters based on those archetypes and he gives them you know like be careful because the, these are blunt tools that you can use but everybody everywhere knows these archetypes so can easily identify with them so that's why they're so often used and rep not not used obviously but um referenced um or show up as characters in a book and oh i had some examples like um he gives like for his magician or shaman he gives examples of you know your standard ones um you have macbeth um in harry potter books you've got your dumbledore um, who also is the mentor or teacher, but in, um, in, um, I have an example of, uh, for the magician or shaman, it would be Sean in Psych. He plays the part sometimes of the magician or shaman, but then he also plays the part of, um, the trickster, which is another archetype. Cool. Um, one thing I want to go back to right before archetype, he goes over character technique and um, he says that to write a successful multi-hero story, oh, yeah. you must put each main character through seven steps. And he goes through and tells you what those are. And then he gives you um, some techniques you can use to add narrative drive to your, your oh. multi-hero story. And he gives you, he gives you all of that. Um, and then he starts talking about um, your archetype. So I just wanted to go back and point that out. Interesting. Um, Before you go on, so with the, because um, I wrote um, for an example of the um, adding narrative drive to a multi-hero st story. It's so difficult to do a multi-hero hero story. But Heroes, do you remember the old TV show, Heroes, speaking of which, that had a multi-hero? I never saw it, but I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great example of that and how the, that show started to fall apart because it's so difficult to do for multi, for a, a long period is to, and you were starting to lose track of the, the, the main desire line in that story and it had to change from season to season or season to season to keep it going and it faltered. But what were the, the seven steps? On what page are the seven steps to building this multi? -character? Bottom of 65. Character technique, multiple heroes, and narrative drive is like the title of that section. Okay. And it's weakness and need, desire, opponent, plan, battle, self-revelation, and new equilibrium. Um, and it says that if you don't do that, your character is not a main character, 
and the audience has not seen him move through the minimal stages of development. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. And to come back to your heroes thing, I think a lot of times if you try to do, I think a multi, like two hero, you could do that. Yeah. But when you get too many, what happens is to me, I think the reason some of them fail is I will be attached to one character yeah. and you're attached to another character. And now my character's doing great this season. And so you're like, whatever. <laughs> well, next season, what if it switches? Yeah. And now my character who I was loving, you're like kicking him to the curb and like all these horrible things are happening to him. I'm no longer interested. Yeah. So in order to give everybody equal time, you have to rotate. So you don't want to rotate through too many characters because then you, you end up with people who just aren't interested anymore because you're doing things that you didn't do the first, when you have a multi, like a bigger book or multi-season yeah. show um or one two three movie you've changed things up okay like transporter did you see the movie transporter yes okay one and three were fabulous okay. two you could just take it out of the cycle it's just not even we almost didn't see three because two was so bad Interesting. but hello jason statham so we we decided to give it. And I don't know if Statham was in three or not. I don't remember. That might be the one where they switched to the guy. I can't remember his name. Um, but um, we almost, the only reason we watched it is because we liked number one so much. Mm -hmm. But a movie is a two to three hour commitment. Yes. If you're writing a book, do you really want someone to get through the first part of book two? hate it they're not going to invest the time nope. into book three you've you've killed it for them so make sure that if you want to use multi-heroes that you you develop them all same way and you um unless one is going to be obviously like superman say there was more than one hero in superman obviously superman is the main character like the main right. person there could be more um, but you need to be careful that you're not um, like heroes. Yeah. Like, or like the Marvel universe. I mean, they, they all together, they're a team, but each one of them just about has their own story or comic line. Like, you know, you've got your Iron Man. And for some of those movies, he was obviously, it was, he had a separate one, but he was the leader and, and things like that. And um, same with Thor. Thor was a, supporting character in some of the movies you know he had some great lines but he wasn't the hero until he had his two movies and what a hero he is thank you very much for that but oh hero thor okay i'm sorry i digress <laughs> let's get back to um all right so yeah so those are some um and i don't think i don't even have those seven steps which is i'm very curious about that we'll have to talk more on on a, another thing because i have the um adding narrative drive and i circled a lot of that um and i added the thing about the heroes tv show um but yeah and then we went into the, yeah we went into the archetype and then i love his guidelines for um, um he also talks about individualizing characters in the web but i love his guidelines for creating your hero just yeah. fabulous I highlighted a bunch of that and so things your hero must be that your hero must be fascinating which seems like a no-brainer but um i have um when i'm working on my book found places in my book where my hero falls flat because i'm i'm having a dialogue with between you know where somebody else is shining because it's a funny scene and my hero is just there playing straight man straight woman i'm like that i have to fix that because i mean that it's about the book is about her and it, she has to shine. She has to be at all times fascinating, which is not as easy as it sounds. Okay. He, gives, he does give some great tips. Like um, they have to be relatable, but they also have to be great, like in terms of that superhero. And they have to have that desire. And it talks more about the weakness and need. Um, and I love the whole concept he gave about being empathetic, but not sympathetic. And I, um, 
there are so many characters in fiction that we can think about or um, relate to when we say empathetic, but not sympathetic. For example, Tony Soprano in The Sopranos. I, for, I, I don't think that was the first time, but was the most notable time in my life where my husband and I talk about it all the time, where all of a sudden we are rooting for a definite anti-hero. I mean, this is a person with, in real life, you do not want this kind of person to survive, not to make, be in prison for doing these horrid, horrid, abominable, abominable. Speaking of <laughs> anti-heroes, the abominable snowman is also a <laughs> <laughs> but um these horrid things you know. i didn't know he was in godfather <laughs> <laughs> he has a minor role <laughs> but totally yes. forgettable right yeah totally forgettable but so yeah tony soprano is a great example of an anti-hero who you fi- you can find yourself rooting for him if you watch that that series or but um not you're not sympathizing but empathizing, like why he did some of the things and why he had to do some of the things that he did. Um, another one for me is Agatha Raisin. Um, she's a co- in Cozy Mystery, um, a, a series re- written by M.C. Beaton. She's one of my faves. And I could not finish the book the first time I read the first book in that series because I didn't like that character. I hated that character. I was like, I can't, I don't care if this character, I don't like her. She's not a nice person. <laughs> Well, sometimes your heroes are not nice people. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 since I'm, at, I'm at book 20 in that series. So obviously MC Beaton did something right in making a hero. Um, and by the way, for those of you um, who know the um, Agatha Raisin series, there's one on television that came out um, from uh, Made in Great Britain and we, they show it here in the U.S. Um, that Agatha Raisin, completely different from the Agatha Raisin in the books. <laughs> they share the name and career and some of the, some other things, but that's it. She's really nice and fun and sassy and cute on the TV show. In the books, you're not going to like her. No, but we wouldn't watch the TV show if we didn't like the main character. Exactly. That's true. If she did some of the things she did in the book, I would have switched it off. Yes, one of the things that he points out in going with the empathy and sympathy is it says that your audience needs to understand the character and what he's doing, but not necessarily like what he's doing. So I get where you're coming from. I understand why you did it. You're still going to prison, but I get it. I understand. And I, re- I, re- I don't re- I want to say the movie's Ransom. Don't quote me on that. Oh. It was a Mel Gibson movie. Oh, yes. Yes. I remember. And I remember the preview. I was going, and I remember watching the preview thinking, is he the bad guy? Like, is he playing the bad guy? And at the end of the preview, it says, get ready to root for the bad guy. And I was like, okay, yes. Like whatever. I remember what the preview was, but I remember going, yes, I don't, I'm I'm going to, I'm going to watch that. And I'm going to root for him to win just based on, so you can't have a hero. Mm-hmm. that's a bad guy yeah like <clears throat> you can do that um as long as you make them relatable yes and someone that the audience can empathize with exactly um and they he also talks about um see this cha- this ca- this chapter on character is huge guys this is this is really good stuff in this book um which is why you should buy the book um or get it from the library but um character change, which is something we've read about in other author craft or story craft books is that arc that a character has to go through. And that's the one that I struggled with for years until I read some other um, craft book about writing commercial fiction or series fiction. Because in um, a a blockbuster movie or for, well, not actually a blockbuster movie. It doesn't it doesn't work, but I, I struggled with having my characters have an arc because if they make a big change, then in the next book, what are we talking about for the, in this series? Um, but there are such things, and he doesn't go into this as much in this book, but, um, but his examples of the um, change are really great in here, the, the arc, the change arc that your characters um, must go through. And I love what he says about the smaller the change, the less interesting the story, which I find interesting, really interesting. And I have a lot of question marks um, about that one because 
my character has a flat arc. So there's not a lot of change in her because she's supposed to, I'm hoping that she'll be as popular as Agatha Raisin one day, you know, 20 books that people are buying uh, one day with uh, this character. So there are changes in the book, changes around her, changes to other people, changes in the way she perceives things, but um, she doesn't have a huge arc, but I'm still dealing with that and working through how, um, how to still make that um, compelling. I like throughout his book, he has, he breaks it down to, he's got key points throughout. And one of his key points when he talks about changing is he says, always begin at the end of the change with the self-revelation, then go back and determine the starting point of the change, which is the hero's need and desire, then figure out the steps of development in between. Yeah. So what do you want the change to be? Now, how is he going to get there? Which for those of you who are pantsers, that's not going to work very well for you. However, um, something that he does point out at some point in all of this I don't remember where it was in the book is when he and when he said it I remember thinking yes that's actually what I used to do I always knew what I wanted the end of my book to be yeah and now I'm going to write to get my characters there and that's all he's saying in this is what's the end going to look like what do you want the end result to be now go back and figure out how is your hero and all of the opponents and everything, how is everyone going to get to that end point? And that's how you figure out, especially if say you, say you have an Agatha Raisin mm -hmm. and she's just horrible and you, and it's only one book, like you're not doing a series, you're just doing one book. But at the end of the book, you want to have done something fabulous that everyone now wants to support her. Okay, fine. That's great. Now, how are you going to get her from horrible to no one even wants to say hi to her when she walks in the street and they cross the road when she's coming to whatever business that she opened yeah. has so many people that it's standing room only and they're in the streets trying to get in like what's the what are the steps you're going to take everybody through to get her to there and I like how he says look at the end what do you what does your end want to look like now how are you going to get everybody there I like that I, I, yeah, that, the way of looking at that was great. Um, and I also like, uh, let's see, I wrote down one of the things that I wrote down for this book was, um, what's at stake if the hero doesn't change is something you have to think about. So speaking of that Agatha Raisin um, change, um, if she doesn't change, what would be at stake? And what's the reason the, the, the reader is gonna keep reading about this character? Um, so that's one of the, another way of looking at your stakes or your, your character change. Um, and you actually bring up a good point. If you're writing a one hit wonder and you only have, like, you're not interested in writing multiple books about the character, um, then yes, you want people to read to the end and you want a good review and you want them to tell people about your book, but you're not as concerned about what is the future going to look like for this character. Yeah. You just want to get them to the end of the book. Yeah. But if you're going to write a series of books, like you, you don't want to turn off your readers so that halfway through or three fourths of the way through the first book, they're going, nah. And then they're looking at every other book you wrote. Well, I didn't like her other book. Why would I read this one? Yeah. Like, I mean, my current works in progress are literally each a different genre. And I have to, like, if someone reads book A and it's so horrible that they're like, well, I don't care that this one is a YA fantasy. I hated this other one over here. So this one's going to be just the same. So keep in mind that if you, you have a character that everybody hates and you don't do anything with that character to wrap it all up at the end, your readers may think that that's how all of your books are going to be. Oh, yeah. And unless you're Nicholas Sparks, you're probably not going to get away with it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you want a long, successful career as an author, yeah. 
Yeah. Which is why we read craft books to try and get better. All right. So, um, and then he talks one last other thing he talks about in character change is that double reversal. And um, which is a great technique that is not present in all books or all movies, but is a great technique to use where the the character changes and it changes back. <laughs> and um, a, a super cool thing to, to a uh, super cool technique that he writes about in here. Uh, and then we'll move on to the desire line. And Ooh. I, oh yeah, go back. Let's go. Two steps. Um, I want to go right back before double reversal. Okay. He talks about the moment of revelation. Oh yeah. And he actually gives you one, two, three, four, four things that the moment of revelation qualities it should have. And then it gives you three things that should be the setup to that revelation. So following the steps and making sure you set it up right and you reveal it right will help get your book continuing to move forward. Um, and hit all of the pieces that your um, your readers looking for. Okay, now we can go. Sorry. Oh, okay. Desire. Because no, no, okay. I just wanted to say. So this is one of the. This is just the character side, and you can see I've got lots of post-its in here and writings in the the margin. Um, one thing that I didn't mention um, how was how important he said the that change is. He says if you master the range of change, you will win the game of storytelling. If not, you will rewrite and rewrite and still not get right. And, and I write, yep, like preach. Yep, that's true. <laughs> Did not have, uh, could not get that right for a while in one of my earlier attempts. All right, so then we move on to, oh, I'm still in creating the hero because I highlighted so much of that. Um, building conflict. And I skipped ahead a, a little bit on that. Or is that where you are or where are you? You started to talk about desire and then I went back. Oh, okay. Desire line. Yep. Um, and we talked a little bit about the, I, I mentioned the desire line because it's so important. Um, is like we said, the is what Truby says is the essential spine of the story. And it has to be clear. And it's the dr thing that drives the person from first page to the last page. To see, did they get it? Are they, did, or did they not get it? Which is also an ending for a book. And it also builds steadily through the storyline. It's not, yeah. right. It, it builds um, steadily in impo impo importance. It's important and it's intensity. <laughs> um, uh, gosh. Yeah, that, that uh, one, oh yeah, there's so many. This whole character thing, this whole character chapter, so rich, so good. Um, so we talked about the, oh, we didn't talk about, so the opponent, um, we talked a little bit about the opponent, but I love that, um, um, he, you talked about the three criteria for a, a desire line. So when you get to the opponent, he talks about how, um, that's a main part. That's part of creating your hero is creating that anti, you know, that opponent, and how they have to be, um, the opponent has to be necessary. They have to be human. Um, like I, I, I like to think about Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes was the, you know, the, a great detective, of course, but how much greater was he or how, how, how finer was he or sharper was he when he was up against someone who was equally great, like a Moriarty, his arch nemesis. Um, and I also think about detectives like, sorry, yeah, obviously you know I'm a mystery buff, but um, Columbo, one of my favorite detectives is Columbo. And Columbo was just, you know, you're, he, you know, he came up as a beat cop, obviously, all, like all detect or detectives or cops do. And he now he's this great detective. Um, but each one of the Columbo episodes um, pits this great detective against an equally great murderer. And um, so um, Columbo was an example of not a who done it. In Columbo, you always know who done it. You know who done it from the beginning of that show. But how is the great Columbo going to catch him and put him in jail? Um, so that's an example of 
those opponents. I mean, if Colombo was just up against some guy who shot his wife in a, and then got in a car and drove to New Jersey and like left fingerprints everywhere. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't show you how great a detective Colombo does, but you need a great opponent. And um, so that was, I love how he says, um, so they can't just be the superhero. They have to, I mean, depending on your genre, they have to be human, um, your opponent. Um, they have to have values that oppose those of the hero. So these are the steps in creating a great um, um, opponent. And um, they also have to have a, their own moral argument, which is probably gonna be flawed because it's in contrast to your heroes. Right. And one of the things that I never think about is when you're talking when you're talking about an opponent is to give them some similarities, and that's one in this current rewrite that I'm doing, is I'm looking at the um, the uh, opponent and trying to figure out what are some of the similarities or where can I emphasize that in the book. The one part that I didn't get so much. Go ahead, Amy. I was just going to say is that he talks also about having the hero and the opponent in the same places that's yeah i just don't get that. is that the part yeah. yeah so it's like you can't have conflict if they don't ever see each other yeah that's true. like they've got to run into each other there has to be even if it's like a detective who's um going after a serial killer the detective may never see the serial killer because the serial killer's tracking the detective yeah but you still have a, a interaction between the two because the serial killer is following the detective. So he's watching the detective have dinner with his family and he's commenting on it in the book. So even if you don't have them face to face, you still need to have them in the same place as each other and let your audience know that at least one is keeping track of the other. Yeah. yeah. And then it goes through all examples, which takes us to building conflict yes which is the box that box that right there i love that box um and he he get he gives an example of your standard two character opposition hero and opponent or right villain hero villain hero villain, villain. one you know it goes this way yeah but um how much richer is your book if you have that four corner opposition with the diagonals and the cool thing so that's um a great exercise or a great visual to use to build that uh conflict or opposition in your books and then he gives us five rules for that and gives us examples of what all that looks like mm -hmm. um and one of the things he points out is um by identifying the negative as well as the positive side of the same value. So remember we talked about having them have some of the same values. Um, it says you can see how each character is most likely to make a mistake while fighting for what he believes. Yeah. So Audrey and I can have the same value, but they could be on opposite ends of like we could both, one thing could be important to both of us but for completely different reasons. And that's what he's talking about is he's got, you've got your opponents that, um, okay, detective story. Everybody's going after the pretty girl. The detective wants to save her mm -hmm. from the other three people. And the other three people all want to get to her as well for different reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you need to show how they're all working towards their value, but yet in opposition of each other because they each believe something differently about the same thing. Um, and another good example of a modern um, example of that is going back to the he uh, Marvel Heroes universe or Marvel universe, the current movies. Um, all of the Marvel heroes are trying to help humanity and trying to help fellow man and they're you know the good guys um for the first time in a long time you see the some of um some of the impacts of that which aren't so good but um they're trying to help humanity and then you have a super villain like thanos who has this glove with the rings and it has the thing the, the symbols and all the stuff that he has to get and he wants to help too 
But the way he wants to help is by eliminating half of the population of, of the world <laughs> universe, which, you know, that's a, another, that's a flawed um, side of the same coin. I want to help. I'm going to help you by eliminating half of the, um, of everybody, like one half, just at random. So that's a, an example of one of the, that flawed right. argument, moral argument. Yep. So, Anything else on this chapter? Yeah. Now that it's taken us half an hour to go through. <laughs> it was a good chapter, y'all. We'll, we'll do a shorter one on the next one. Uh, character is so important to a book. Um, so there's the exercise. Uh, let me see if I can get that in there. The um, writing exercise number three. And he has these great exercises at the end of all of the chapters. And there are some um, things that we've mentioned, like the seven tips for this or the three um, <laughs> rules for that. Bless you. Sorry. But um, which you can also use as exercises. So they're not formally called out as exercises, but I've written them and highlighted them for myself to go through as exercises for my work in progress. But that's it for character. Now let's talk about moral argument. We've talked a little yeah. bit about it as we've talked about character, though, so it won't be quite as long. And I think the chapter is also shorter. So yes. So chapter five. Um, chapter five. Let's see, where do we want to start? So he, he says that theme is the author's view of how to act in the world. It is your moral vision. Yes. That's what he says. <laughs> I don't have quite as much for the moral argument just because I've always struggled with theme, but I love how he takes theme um, and he relates it to something, um, the, theme, the theme line, which I didn't highlight it, but um, he relates it to something of a concept that he calls the designing principle. And then he takes that designing principle, um, which he mentions in chapter two, and now he gives you examples. So if you struggled with the designing principle and coming up with, after you did your premise for your book of coming up with your designing principle, in this chapter, chapter five, he gives all kinds of examples um, of um, from Ulysses to four weddings and a funeral, the Harry Potter books um, of both a designing principle and a theme line. So for example, for Harry Potter, um, the theme line is when you are blessed with great talent and great power, you must become a leader and sacrifice for the good of others, which is similar to the theme line for Spider-Man. <laughs> with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> but he has examples from Copenhagen, A Christmas Carol, Citizen Kane, uh, which is the one that I could think of before. But, um, and then, um, moral decision he goes over the moral decision of your hero um did you have any i don't want to move forward before um on the theme line or designing principle um the only thing i wanted to because i didn't highlight as much in this section either but i want to go back to the very beginning because um i said that well he said i read <laughs> the theme is the author's view of how to act in the world Mm -hmm. The very next page, he said, you never want to create characters that sound like a mouthpiece for your ideas. Yes. Good writers express their moral vision slowly and subtly, primarily through story structure and the way the hero deals with a particular situation. So you don't want to beat them over the head with it. Please You want to sprinkle it in, in the way that you develop your story and how your hero deals with it. Um, it can, it's still your vision for it. Um, you just don't want to, you know, throw it out there, like smack them in the face. And now this is the way it is. It's kind of like, um, when you see, I'm going to use purple. Sorry, Audrea. It's when you look at the, the color wheel for purple it starts out as a very, very soft lilac, right? And then you look at the color wheel and it just, it keeps going and it keeps going until you have a deep, dark eggplant, right? Mm -hmm. But there's all those colors in between that slowly change until you have this awesome, or not so awesome if you're Audrea, this awesome, deep, dark purple, right? Um, 
and it's the same way with a story. You don't want them to be like, Papa! you want them to be like, oh, that's, that's nice and soft. What color is that? Not bold and big and smack you over the head with it. Right. Right. So that's the only thing I wanted to point out. Yeah. And I love that. And um, if you want, I don't know if, if many of you know some of these examples, but I mean, he gives great examples in the book, but one of the examples that um, I had no idea, I read these books as a child and uh, saw the movies. I had no idea that the lion, the witch in the wardrobe, when I read, because I didn't read them in a class setting or in a, you know, um, a church setting or anything. I had no idea that they had at the back of them, a theme about resurrection and good. I had no, I, I had no clue. I, I was an adult and they're like, well, you know, it's about Jesus. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like Hades it is. I read those books. It's about a magical wonderland. You go through the wardrobe and you find it. And then there's this, you know, they're like, and the lion. Yeah. And then what happens to the lion? Well, he, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. There's an example of subtle. For yeah. me, it was subtle. Unless you told me, and if you told me as a child, I probably would not have read that book. <laughs> but the books are great. Everybody should read Lewis Carroll's uh, The Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, no matter what side of those things you come out. Those are just re really great classics for a reason. Um, an example of not so subtle, but still super popular is any movie by Tyler Perry. Um. <laughs> no subtlety whatsoever and I love me some mama and and um those things but um those the themes of those are always they, they come out swinging there's a, there's no question in your mind uh the good the bad and and what what he's what his theme is in those all right um, yeah it's so kind of like Tyler Perry Theme is not imposed on the characters, but rather is expressed through the characters. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, to be, um, and then, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, to be fair, <laughs> I mean, although it's really quite obvious um, uh, in Tyler Perry's work, you know what the theme is. I mean, it's it's it, it's obvious, but there are some. There's like when you say it's not. Um, what was your it's not it's expressed through he has characters that the, the theme is expressed through and uh, what was the others the other side of that um is that it's not imposed on the characters oh so he has he has a little of both mixed in those and uh, super popular and yeah I, I i've never missed one of his mama's what's her name it's not mama i don't know because i've never Medea. seen Medea. oh love me some Medea. Um, he's hung up the Medea, but um, yeah, and he has all kinds of, he has television shows, he has his own channel, his yeah. own studio, obviously doing well, and good on you, um, but those are examples of theme being a little bit more obvious. And then he moves to theme through structure. Mm -hmm. um, on the first part, I want to point out, he says, structure doesn't just carry content, it is content. Um, and it's far more powerful content than what the characters say. See, and that's one that I still have a little bit of trouble with um, that kind of, or with my theme whenever I'm, and I don't know if it's because I'm, I'm I never think of it, <laughs> I never think of it at the start. And I usually, it's usually in workshops or critique circles where someone says, well, I love that your theme is blah, blah, blah. I'm like, let me write that down because I had no idea that was the theme. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so glad you answered that question for me. <laughs> well, this is the way this is the way he breaks it down. He says that at the self-revelation, especially if it's a moral revelation, the theme expands. Mm -hmm. At the moral decision, it expands again. And because the theme has been expressed primarily through the structure, it seems to emerge from the very soul of the audience, not to have been imposed on them like a tiresome sermon. Oof -da. So yeah. as, as you go through, it's built as the story is built. Yeah. yeah. And I just love it when it's like that. When, when you read a book where, I mean, it's, it's builds. Those are some of the best books. Those are the page turners where you, um, not just the conflict, but a theme that drives you through the book. It's the book that you're reading and you're like, I'm just going to read one more chapter. And then it's <laughs> light outside and you're going, what happened? 
Yeah. Is it, is, is it time to go to work now? Is like, it time to go to work now? Um, and here's another example of um, basic strategy for moral argument. Um, that's at, at the bottom of my page 120. That's right after um, the next page for me after that whole theme uh -huh. structure where that's not actually an exercise. But if you read through your basic strategy, you can use that as an exercise for yeah. your work in progress. So reading through his examples and then how to use that, apply that strategy is a great exercise. And I, I highlighted it with pink, which means I need to, to work on that some more. Just why this whole I book was not as um, coordinated with my highlighting as you are. All right. So then um, he goes through, I, I did really did like his, um, I'm up to the good versus the bad or the variance on moral argument. Was there, should we cover? I mean, great examples from the Iliad going up to that and moral, moral argument technique for balancing moral argument with plot. That whole thing. Yes. I had one thing to point out on that part. Um, he says that plot is an intricate choreography of actions by the hero and the opponents designed to surprise the audience. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> says it's the element of surprise of magic that floats the moral sequence and gives it its punch wow yeah really I like that. love the way he put that all right so and that's we, all i had for that section that's, well i just had another pink one for um how to do that whole balancing the moral with the plot and i love how that he used the verdict the verdict is one of my favorite movies it's written by one of my favorite playwrights David Mamet and so he uses that as an example in that whole balancing moral argument with plot I love David Mamet's stuff um, and then he uses Iliad as an example but um, then we get to the variance on the on the moral argument which I really loved that he did um, the good versus the bad um, like for example, um, he has a sequence. Here's one a, a part of the sequence. I'm not gonna read the whole section, but the hero has a, psych, a psychological weakness, but is essentially good. And you see that with um, a lot with like maybe the hero is an alcoholic, but he's a really good lawyer, and he has to you know sober himself up long enough to be the lawyer that he needs to be to save this right. innocent character or whatever it or is. Or go to court and save his kid from having to go to jail. Yeah. 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 And um, then there's the, um, oh, yeah. or, or what's the movie? Hang on a second. I literally just like, as you were, as I said that, I thought it's the one where, um, ah, dag, nab it all the kingdom come. It's the, the one where the kid joins the army, but he doesn't want to fight. He wants to be a chaplain and he has the right to not carry a gun and they want to kick him. It's a, it's space. Um, I did not see that movie. It's based on a true story. Um, dang it, I can't remember. But anyway, he's he's up for court martial because his whole platoon is like, we can't go to war with you if you're not carrying a gun. Yeah, and he's like, it's against my moral compass because of his dad, yeah, who's a drunk and who came back from the war totally off his rocker, right? Well, his dad shows up at his court martial in his uniform and sobers himself up long enough to stand before the people that are about to kick his son out of the military to be like, what you're doing isn't right. He has the right to do this and not have to, you know, go against his moral standings. And then he leaves and goes home and doesn't actually say anything to his son, but he gets himself together enough to go into court and stand up for his son. So Ooh, it's it. a fab, I need to figure right. out the name of the movie. So Amy is going to remember what that movie is and she's going to put it in the show notes and say, this is the movie that I couldn't remember. Yes. And it's really good. I, I got goosebumps just hearing you describe that scene. And that is a great example of a moral argument and a balancing that in a movie. That's awesome. You remember what that movie was. So now let's tell yeah. people. Hexall Ridge. If you yeah. haven't seen it, you need to go see it. It's it's fabulous. The acting in that, the writing, like 
everything about that movie was that, and it's based on a true story. I did not know it was based on a true story. And I do know Andrew Garfield because I am a huge fan of Spider-Man. So I've seen every Spider-Man ever made. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's, he, and he was a great geeky, tall, lanky Spider-Man, but I didn't see that movie. Be, well, I don't see a lot of the based on true, especially if it's military, because that gets depressed and breaks my heart. But it's just I you can't talking see, about that scene what gave me goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, I can't see based on true story that are closer to my time frame. Oh, yeah. But I can see ones from like my grandpa's time frame. Like those aren't a problem for me. Yeah. The ones that are a problem for me are the ones that would be something that my brother would have encountered. Oh, yeah. Then I have like, I can't do those. So anyway, yes, Hacksaw Ridge, go see it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So um, then we, he goes into tragedy. Um, so any of you writing tragedy or any of the good versus the, the examples he gives are from Wuthering, Heart, Hot, Wuthering Heights and King Lear. And then the pathos um, where he says pathos is a moral argument that reduces the tragic hero to an everyman and appeals to the audience by showing the beauty of endurance, lost causes and the doomed man. And some of the examples he gives are ones that we, a lot of us have seen the, um, I didn't see the cherry orchard, but I have seen the conversation. I love the conversation and death of a salesman, which um, I would not have put that there. Oh, streetcar named desire. God, that is, it's such a brilliant film, but it is so dark. Um, and Don Quixote are some other examples he gives of that one. And I love how for each of these, he always gives examples of um, yeah. for um, good versus bad of course you've got your crocodile dundee <laughs> that's a classic <laughs> and uh, wizard of oz um super classic and then he goes into satire and irony um for mor moral argument and i've seen a lot of those like american beauty he he does american beauty as an example throughout the book and that is one of my favorite films um wedding crashers which is another um great example of satire and some of my favorite actors in that one. And um, he gives this, and I, so I spent a lot of time reading because I love comedy um, and I love satire, uh, reading his examples for, or the main steps for the satiric ironic argument. And so he gives the whole long list bullet points there for that one. And um, great examples like Jane Austen's Emma for that one. And then, of course, black comedy, my one of my faves too. Um, when we get when we get past the stuff that makes you cry, that's my jam. <laughs> I like the the funny stuff, the satirical stuff, and then of course your your, your standard mysteries. And so he gives the whole um, how the black comedy moral argument works, and um, he talks about there's one sane person, usually um, an ally, also an ally um, within the system. And then there are the opponents also within the system. Uh, one really good one. I don't know if um, Office Place, he doesn't mention that one, but I would put that one in this, in the examples of sort of like a dark comedy. Um, but a great example of using that, um, what, what is it called? The black comedy moral argument, using the moral argument in a comedy. Yes. I just looked at one of the titles he gave as an example for the black comedy and I'm like, what? Which the one? positively true adventures of the alleged Texas cheerleader murdering mom. That was great. That was great. That was it, was it true? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was based on a true, but they, I think, well, that's what they do with a lot of things that are just so bizarre. A lot of stuff that happens in Florida. We all know about the Florida man <laughs> reports. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, they probably are just you know a Tuesday for you, but for the rest of the United States, we're going. A Florida man did what? <laughs> Actually, what you do is you hear the story, you're like, that was Florida, right? Yep, so, Florida. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, that one they so they take something and either if it's so off the wall bizarre, they have to make it more realistic <laughs> to make a comedy a real comedy out is of it. Is that the one where the the mom killed somebody so her daughter could get on the cheerleading squad? It'd be, yeah, I had cheerleader, yep. And I think, 
the version I saw had Sybil <laughs> Shepherd. It's one of those. I believe that's the one I saw. I don't quote me on that, but um, that sounds else? like a part she would play. <laughs> well, she does it well. Okay, so um, <laughs> they talk about she. He talks about combining moral arguments, which I thought was yeah. really good. I um, really liked a lot of how he talked. He talked about how you put these two things together um, to make uh, the good versus bad argument, or um, mix tragedy with elements of black comedy. And then he also points out it's really hard to mix them if you don't do it right. Yes. Yeah. Because you know, yeah, people, what, am I supposed to laugh at this? This is too dark. I'm crying, but I'm, I don't know what's happening. I oh my gosh. I I'll laugh at something and Randy will look at me and he was, he, he's actually looked at me and going, what is wrong with you? I'm like, that is hilarious. He's like, no, it's not. I'm like, yes, it was. Oh <laughs> gosh. There are many movies. I don't. I know four weddings and a funeral. There's another one that was like this. That was based on a funeral where you can't help but laugh and you feel like you're like I don't. It's mortifying, but it's also come on. That's funny. I don't care who you are. <laughs> um, I find myself wanting to write stuff like that, but then I'm like, yeah, but then somebody will know that that came out of my head. So yeah, we're gonna pass. <laughs> you should just get it out. Just just let that be your art. Um, and then I did the exercise for this one, writing exercise number four. And when you guys get this book, you're going to get way more exercises, like I said, than what he calls an exercise in this book, if you're, um, doing some of the strategies and stuff, but outlining the moral argument. And I've had that one highlighted as an exercise for me to repeat for my current work in progress, um, where he talks about the designing principle and start by turning the designing principle of your story into a theme line. So that's part of that exercise at the end of this chapter. So that takes us to the end of the moral argument chapter, um, which is chapter number five. Anything else on either of those? those are, we've been a lot on this. We told you, we told you when we did. <laughs> Was that a pen falling to the ground? That was a pen. That was one of my pens. But we told you when we did the intro for this, this is not light. It is 400 plus pages of tiny font, Mr. Truby. Tiny font. Um, of the yes, and if the font had been any bigger, the book would have been so big that no one would have even looked at it because they're like, I'm not reading that. Like, seriously, your book would have been this thick. It would have been, yeah, this would have been a textbook. Just big old textbook. <laughs> um, maybe in your next version, maybe Mr. Truby, hint, hint, maybe do a special edition. Maybe do a Kickstarter with some pictures from some of your examples, maybe some updated examples, maybe in a size 11 font, <laughs> 12. <laughs> Not four. <laughs> I'm, there are many people who would buy it and make more white space so I can take more notes. <laughs> so you know, um, no, I am, even though I it, it is dense, yes, it's dense. it is dense. Um, I found myself going, "Ooh, I like that." Yeah, like that's like I'm like I'm all about save the cat. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm like, but will this help me make, and will this help me make a more in-depth, compelling mm -hmm. story? Because my characters are going to be developed more, my plot and my theme and my structure, like, is this going to help me make a better story? Right. Yeah. And we both want we both would love to have a movie yes from one of our stories so and i know when i write i visualize it as a movie while i'm writing it i think this will by following so far by following what he has written um maybe when i write what i write and people read it they'll also be reading it as a movie yeah. Like in their head, they'll be able to see all the things that I see. 
So I'm excited for this book. I'm excited to, I mean, you can see where the bookmark is. Like this, this is how much we've read and I'm already excited. Yes. Like there's all that more to go. A so. lot more to go, a lot more episodes to go. And um, so if you, even if you're not thinking about writing, uh, doing screenwriting, this is great for, like we said, this is why we started this book. It's great for fiction writers. It's great for literary because lots of his, his examples are from literary fiction, but it's also relatable for commercial fiction or genre fiction. And um, there's lots of places where you can see lectures from Mr. Truby on YouTube or interviews uh, from him on YouTube. And so anyway, that is it for this episode um, of the, uh, the Right Crowd. Like and subscribe. Like Tell your friends. Follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. All the places. All the things. And if you have joined our newsletter, <laughs> we're going to get that fixed really soon. And you'll be getting a newsletter from both Amy and my, myself about what's going on and what's coming up if you subscribe. Thanks. Bye.